Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome uh, to the very first Sci-Fi Ontario PHI Grand Rounds. I'd like to welcome everyone here in the room at Public Health Ontario and all of those people participating uh, via webinar. Uh, I will let you know that we will remain in lecture mode for the duration of this call. Um, if you have any questions, please send them through the chat pod, and that's located in the bottom right of your screen. Um, introduce myself quickly. My name is Eric Devine. Um, I'm from Sci-Fi Ontario, branch executive. I'm a communications counselor. I'd like to thank uh, all of our colleagues here at Public Health Ontario and those that have worked uh, to initiate the series that will take place on, on the second Wednesday of every month. Uh, our, and the presentations will be posted um, on the uh, Sci-Fi Ontario website and on our YouTube channel. And I'll take this brief moment to um, send out uh, an additional call for abstracts if there's anyone that has a presentation that you're interested in seeing, or if you have one that you would like to present, please contact Sci-Fi Ontario. Um, the decks will be posted also to the Sci-Fi Ontario Knowledge Center. And I would like to thank Public Health Ontario for their work in particular in this collaboration. Um, this is an excellent education opportunity for public health inspectors. And we'll remind you that um, these series do contribute credits for professional development hours for the Continuing Professional Competencies Program. So please, if you are in a room with a large group of people, make sure that you are signing up individually beforehand um, so that you do get credit. And the other benefit to this is it does inform other public health professionals and interested parties of the breadth and depth of the public health inspector role. And with that, we'll launch in um, our, our inaugural series, um, the public health response to raccoon rabies in Hamilton. Our presenter today is Connie De Benedet. Connie now lives and breathes nothing but raccoon rabies. Prior to her deep immersion into the raccoon rabies situation in Hamilton, she worked as the vector-borne disease specialist for Hamilton Public Health Services after spending some time working as a PHI in all programs from food safety to water safety and infectious diseases. Previously, Connie worked for Health Canada as an environmental health officer, working to protect the health and safety of some of the First Nations communities under the Treaty 3 Agreement. She started her career after graduating from Ryerson in 1997 and completing her field training in Northwestern Ontario and you can reach Connie at Connie de Benedet at hamilton.ca. We'll turn it over to Connie. Thank you. Thank you, Eric. I welcome everyone to our presentation about the public health response to raccoon rabies in Hamilton. Just before I begin, I'd like to give a special shout out to Adam Monroe. He's our geographic information system technologist who helped construct this presentation you're about to see. It is a story map using S3. You'll see that uh, he's the brains behind this, uh, this show. So I hope uh, by the end of this presentation, you, uh, you folks will understand some of the circumstances that have led up to the discovery of raccoon rabies in Hamilton. You'll be able to recognize the difference between the routine rabies uh, investigations that health units normally do, uh, as opposed to the raccoon rabies surveillance reports that we are now dealing with in Hamilton. You'll understand how the situation, the raccoon rabies situation in Hamilton has changed our risk. And then we'll also talk about some of the new messaging and ways we're getting out those messages. So for those of you that aren't familiar with Hamilton, Hamilton is a port city in southern Ontario with a population of just over 500,000. It is physically defined by unique features like the Niagara Escarpment and the Hamilton Harbour. Hamilton has a broad mix of urban centres, sprawling farmland and plenty of naturalised areas, all of which are home to plenty different rabies vectors. So you'll see here in this large uh, graph to the right of your screen, uh, it's a history of rabies in Ontario. You can see in 1988, we had uh, just under 400 domestic rabid animals in Ontario. And you'll see a little higher up, just over 1,400 cases of rabies within the wildlife population. So you see those numbers slowly start to decline about 1989. And that is when the Ministry of Natural Resources started their rabies baiting program. So prior to this, uh, some of you may know, Ontario was known as the raccoon, or pardon me, the rabies capital of North America. So not a handle we wanted to hang on to for long. You can see that with the decline of rabies, the MNR baiting program is quite successful. 
You see on the left of your screen is a history of the rabies situation in Hamilton. So Hamilton saw our last case of terrestrial rabies in 1994. The last cases we had were two fosses, one rabid skunk, and a livestock species. Prior to that, our last case of domestic rabies in Hamilton was in 1993 with two rabid cats. So we went for many, many years, uh, just over 20 years, without seeing any cases of terrestrial rabies in Hamilton. So we focused on bats and rabies in bats. In Hamilton, for some reason, and I would assume it's likely related to the rocky escarpment that we back onto, we tend to get a lot of bat reports. Any year, we tend to get between two and 300 bat calls to the health department. So you can see by our stats here, again on the left of the screen, we do tend to see low percentages of rabies in our bat population. You'll see from 2008 to 2011, we saw 10 rabid bats. And again, those are only bats that had human exposure. 2012, we were fortunate we didn't, uh, we didn't find any cases of bat rabies. 2013, we had one case. 2014, three. The following year, the same. And so far for 2016, we are up to two reports of rabid bats in Hamilton. Caught on camera. This video shows it as so You can see here by this video, we often, as health inspectors, follow up on uh, bat night. investigations. Reed and Andrews people tend to get a little confused, to or the it's nighttime, they're not sure what happened. How's the guy doing so now? Take a look at Devin, this video. I can tell you that he's actually he's doing pretty well so all things considered, especially when you consider that he's been taking multiple rabies shots every other day since this happened. Derek Sko was jamming with friends while camping at Pinhead Creek Saturday. That's when a rabid bat made a beeline towards him. It's a bat! Derek Sko swipes the bat away. This thing came out of nowhere. Uh, I was thinking it was a good day until then. His first camping trip cut short by a rabid bat circling above. Something hit me. I was concentrating on the staying in time and all that. And it hit me here. And I kind of saw something on my peripheral vision. And then it's there. And then it, it, and then it just bit me. It latched onto his shoulder. Then crawled up his neck. Do you feel teeth in or do you just kind of feel something afterwards? It was like a cold dog nose. It was a cold bat mm -hmm. nose or mouth or whatever and it didn't sting. It wasn't, it wasn't injected with any poisons or anything like that. It was just a cold bite. The bat camped in a tree long enough for Sko to snap a couple photos. Then the bat came back and circled around Sko two more times. A friend shot the bat with a BB gun something Sko at first hesitated to have happen. And whether we were going to get in trouble for shooting it, and I said, well, it drew first blood, and we need to take care of this thing. The bat ended up being rabid. It was tested by the Multnomah Health Department earlier this week, leaving Sko at high risk for rabies. The rabies shots he's taking multiple times every other day have given him headaches. So with rabies in our area, although in low percentages, we continue to remind people the importance of vaccinating their pets, including the indoor cats. We reminded people to report bites and again, encourage all pet owners to vaccinate pets. In 2010, we did a small study in our health unit involving only the animal owners and pets that were involved in human exposures that we were investigating. We wanted to figure out the per percentage of pets that were actually vaccinated against rabies. We were surprised to find that just under 50% of those pets involved in animal incidents were not vaccinated against rabies. So part of our survey asked animal owners what was holding them back from vaccinating their pets. And you can see here a large portion, 40% approximately, did not want to vaccinate because it was a financial pressure on them. So if you take a look at the stats on whole for Hamilton, you can see that we do have um, more financial pressures than other communities. You'll see one in five residents, that's about 18.1%, live below the low income cutoff. That's uh, significantly higher than you see for the provincial level, which is only 14.7, or the, even the national level at 15.3. Nearly 17% of Hamilton seniors live below the low income cutoff. So we thought we would pull all this information together and meet with our local vets. The goal we had in mind was to establish some low-cost rabies vaccination options for our, our vulnerable population, for our companion pets. 
So we did meet and we did discuss this and unfortunately at that time we were not able to, to come to an agreement on low cost options, uh, but we continued to work towards that and that's always been a goal in the back of our minds. So everything changed in Hamilton in an instant on December 4th when we received a report of a rabid raccoon that was involved in an attack of two dogs. This prompted a lot of questions for us. We wondered was this just a stray, alone uh, stowaway that we just happened to stumble upon because it was sick? Was this going to come back as a bat strain case of rabies? Where did it come from? We really wanted to blame Niagara and their leaky borders, uh, but uh, it wasn't meant to be. We found out later that day that it was in fact raccoon strain rabies. This was the first case of raccoon strain rabies in Ontario since 2006, and the first ever reported case of raccoon rabies in southern Ontario. If you take a look at the map on the right of your screen, you'll see the star that marked this positive raccoon, and you can see it was found in a very populated area. So was it a stowaway? Well, Ministry of Natural Resources came to Hamilton right away and, and did a lot of surveillance. You can see here by the end of December of 2015, we were up to nine rabid raccoons. So we knew it wasn't a lone stowaway unless he rode over on a bus with a bus full of rabid raccoons. We knew this was going to be a long-term problem for us. Rabies experts from the Ministry of Natural Resources and Forestry predicted it could take up to three to five years to eliminate rabies from our area. The situation now in Hamilton is quite different than it was last year at this time. As of September 8th of this year, we now have 106 rabid raccoons. We have 49 rabid skunks after seeing raccoon strain rabies spill over into our skunk population in February. I'm sure some of you have heard that we also had a rabid cat that was reported in August. This wasn't a simple one owner cat either. This was a stray cat that wandered through our community, went into multiple homes, managed to cross three different health unit jurisdictions. This prompted several media releases, both by Hamilton Public Health Services and other health unit jurisdictions. In Hamilton, we also did a door-to-door -door awareness campaign. We didn't want to miss any potential human contacts of this rabid cat. Knowing that this was a stray for us, it prompted us to really look at some um, different rabies control options for our feral cat population. And I'll tell you, if you're having a quiet week and you're a little bored, you can find yourself some excitement by looking into the feral cat population in your community. Initially, when we looked into it, we were told we had tens of thousands of feral or stray cats. The more experts we spoke to and the more we looked into the matter, the higher the number got. We have now estimates that reach up to 300,000 feral cats in our area. The latest spillover occurred when a fox tested positive for raccoon strain rabies in September. Again, as you see the map to the right of your screen, you can see that these rabies cases are everywhere. They're backyards, near children's play equipment, they're in our parks, they're on our golf courses, they're on our trails, they are roadside. They are everywhere you'd expect to find people and pets. So in Hamilton, we report um, positive rabies cases by media area. We have divided the city up into 12 different media areas. So when the media are doing an interview and they want to know a specific location, rather than give them an address, we give them a broader section uh, which we call the media area. If you take a look at the table on the left of your screen, you can see all the 12 media areas. You can also see that rabies is in each of those areas. Safe to say that rabies is well established in the Hamilton area. So you can imagine that all these positive cases and the surveillance reports from these positive raccoons and positive skunks that Ministry of Natural Resources is sharing with us are quite different from our routine rabies investigations. You don't have an animal owner, 
We're not supposed to have a victim. Any animals that are sent through the testing for Ministry of Natural Resources are not supposed to have human exposures or any exposures with domestic pets. So that's supposed to be ruled out prior. So you shouldn't have a person exposed. You shouldn't have an exposure date. There's no need to gather a date of birth or a weight. But there's other key information that you need to develop. So we realized quite early on that we needed to develop our own intake form that captured data that we could talk back and forth with both Ministry of Natural Resources as well as our own Hamilton Animal Services. So we developed this form that you see on the right of your screen. And I'll give you an idea of how the, the process works just quickly. A Hamilton resident finds a sick animal in their backyard. They will call Hamilton Animal Services. Animal Services will arrive see the sick animal, euthanize it, take it back up to animal services where it is put in the freezer until Ministry of Natural Resources comes to pick up those animals on a weekly basis. They are picked up on a weekly basis and taken back to Peterborough where the Ministry of Natural Resources does a field test for rabies. This field test is called the DRIT test. Any DRIT rabies positive results are confirmed by sending them to the Canadian Food Inspection Agency in Ottawa the following week. When the Canadian Food Inspection Agency also confirms those, the results are sent back to Ministry of Natural Resources. Once they receive their own internal ministry approvals, they share those results with us. And they share them by sending this bloody tag to us. So it really gives you an idea of, of all the work and all the risk that's going on there. Uh, you can see the tag, it has the date it was picked up, the service number coincides with our animal services, the location, the animal control officer, type of animal, and you can see they usually put some notes in the bottom. Uh, pay special attention to the notes on this one. It was picked up deceased, body condition and weight are marked as excellent, and no trauma noticed. It's interesting to see that because you'd suspect that an animal that dies of rabies is likely not going to be healthy. You'd likely also expect to see some trauma from an attack from another animal. But this isn't always the case. Anecdotally, we've also heard information from different people that have called in an animal on their property, and the animal initially appeared healthy, no signs of illness, not behaving strange, um, but animal services maybe noticed a small old injury. Those animals came back positive for rabies. So you can't always see, and there may not always be um, attack marks or injuries on these animals. So it's something to keep in mind when you are, when you are evaluating risk as well. Uh, you also see the sticker on there is a DRIT number. We keep track of all that information so we can talk back and forth. We follow up by calling the person who called in the animal. Um, so if it was someone's backyard, we're calling them to make sure they didn't have contact with that animal or their neighbors didn't have contact. We're also making sure that their domestic pets have not had contact. Fortunately, we have not had any cases where there has been human contact with these uh, Ministry of Natural Resources surveillance cases. If we were to find someone that says, yes, I actually got scratched by the raccoon, we would um, slide that over. You see there's a spot near the uh, middle of the form. We would slide that over to our routine rabies investigation and then follow it up accordingly that way. We have, however, found a few of these Ministry of Natural Resources surveillance cases where th there has been a domestic pet or a companion animal that has had contact with the rabbit animal. And in some cases, it's actually been reported that the domestic animal had killed the rabbit animal. So again, of course, those, uh, those instances are reported to the Ontario Ministry of Agriculture, Food and Rural Affairs. So if you take a look at this, uh, this map here on your right, you'll see it's the Ministry of Natural Resources and Forestry Surveillance and Control Zones for this summer. You can see all the blue dots, they would represent the raccoon rabies strain in Hamilton. Those two red diamonds that you see near the Stratford area, those are the two fox strains from the Perth area. The other map on the left of your screen is the uh, trail, the tracks that they used for uh, baiting last December. I'm not sure if you all recall, but last, uh, last December was seasonably warm for us. So for that reason, Ministry of Natural Resources was able to do the rabies baiting in December right after we identified our first case. So you can see here that the, um, the green and pink colors would have been the helicopter baiting. The lime green is where they would have done some hand baiting. 
and the different blue tracks would be the flight path that they used for the, uh, for the twin otter. Directly under that map, you'll see a picture of the baits that are being dropped. Uh, these baits have a marshmallowy type maple scent, so the raccoons and, and skunks are attracted to them. The bait itself, uh, the bait used is an onrab, and it is successful for both raccoon strain rabies as well as the fox strain. Um, it is noted that these are not considered harmful to people or pets, uh, but that being said, when you're dropping thousands of these in your city, you're bound to get some calls about children or pets that come in contact. So of course we do advise people to see their physician or their vet, depending on the type of exposure. So this other map, again, that you're seeing on the right of your screen, these are the uh, control areas for the summer of 2016. You'll see the green area is where they, are, they did the uh, August baiting for raccoon rabies, and the purple areas are some hand baiting. The baiting was done in August, and the goal here was to uh, drop the baits to vaccinate the raccoon cubs that would have been born this spring. You also see the orange area is where they uh, are planning to do the October baiting for the fox strain in the Perth area. So just to give you an idea of, uh, of what it looks like when they're dropping these baits, we'll take a look at a video that was taken from our local, local news station. And I'll tell you that to date, the they have dropped 1.5 million baits. Precision cuts, updos, color, and more at any of our Hamilton Brantford locations. Fast, friendly, okay. affordable service. Sorry about that. Well, the province's Ministry of Natural Resources is sounding the alarm about rabies. So far, they've found 164 animals infected with the disease since December. That's right. Elizabeth Hall caught up with Ministry officers who are busy dropping bait vaccines in an effort to curb the spread of the disease. They're dropping them by chopper, by car, and by hand in parks, neighborhoods, and urban areas. We basically distribute baits in a 50 kilometer radius around any rabies case for two years. So far, 90,000 of the vaccine baits have been spread across the Hamilton area. The vaccine is covered in a marshmallow coating. It actually smells a lot like maple syrup. That's what draws the animal to it. And once they bite in, they'll have the vaccine in their system and they won't be able to get the disease for the next two to three years. 90% of the cases in this rabies outbreak have been discovered in the Hamilton area, the rest in Halton, Brant, and the Niagara region. Bill Dowd is the CEO. So we're very grateful for our media, but uh, media make mistakes once in a while too. So I'll just add, uh, they do mention Halton as having positive cases. To, to date, we haven't seen any positive cases in Halton. However, as much as we've tried to contain um, the raccoon rabies strain within Hamilton, we have had some spillover into Niagara, Brant, and Haldem and Norfolk as well. So we'll move on and we'll talk about our rabies risk assessment tool. This is a tool that our public health inspectors use when we're doing our routine rabies investigations. So typically, uh, one of the questions, as you all know, when you're doing the risk assessment is to ask where the animal is from. Is it from outside of Ontario or from up north or from somewhere where, where rabies is well established? Well, clearly now ha Hamilton has uh, rabies well established, so we become a slightly higher risk. It's concerning when, uh, when you think of pet owners, if they let their pets out in the evening and don't supervise them, it's, it's possible that that pet could have contact with a rabid animal and the owner wouldn't even know. So it's something that we all need to keep in mind. Hamilton has a specialized program uh, for public health inspectors, so not all the inspectors work on the rabies program. So something that we had to do was ensure that all of our inspectors were up to date on the raccoon rabies situation in Hamilton and to understand why and how we had changed the risk so they could apply that, um, especially to those uh, inspectors that cover our on-call. So as you can imagine, another key component and a big part of the uh, raccoon rabies response in Hamilton is education. Uh, of course, we want to get all these important messages out about rabies and personal protection because the last thing we want to see is a human case of rabies. We work with all local schools, um, including public, private, separate, to ensure that all grade two and three students received our locally developed rabies activity book. We also sent a letter to all the school boards and asked that they fan it out 
to all schools, all school staff, and all parents. The letter was to explain what was happening in Hamilton, give, um, give up-to-date information on all the rabies case we, cases we had seen, where they were, and what people needed to do to protect themselves, their children, and their pets. We also partnered with Ministry of Natural Resources to provide some high-risk occupations important training around rabies. These occupations include trappers, nuisance wildlife control, and even our own animal control officers. So some of the messages that we shared with them were they were likely to be the first people that will have contact with a rabid animal. They're nuisance wildlife control. They will have and see rabid animals. We stress the importance of pre-exposure vaccination for them, and we also stress the importance of reporting bites. Unfortunately, uh, some people tend to think just because they have a pre-exposure vaccination, they're invincible, and that future exposures don't, don't require them to report or receive more vaccine. So that's something that we educated everyone so that they knew, even with pre exposure, you still need to report, and in the absence of, of testing or confining um, a domestic animal, we would recommend vaccine. We also, um, as I mentioned before, the Ministry of Natural Resources sends us rabies report on a weekly basis, so we work to update our website. However, we make sure that we update our website at the same time that other health units and other ministries are. Uh, what we don't want to do is announce that there's a very first case in another health unit jurisdiction before they're ready. So it does take a lot of, um, a lot of cooperation on that side. And I'll let you know, you might not think too many people are visiting uh, a rabies website, and uh, it's true. If you don't have a lot of cases of rabies, you're probably not going to get a lot of activity. We took a, lot, a look at our um, website stats for our rabies page from January to March of 2015. So this is, of course, before we had any cases of raccoon rabies. We had 183 hits. If we look at the time span for the same time this year after raccoon rabies is established in Hamilton, we have went from 183 hits to 2,624. So it's good. It's, it's good that the message is getting out. We're happy that people are, are going to our website to get this information. We also utilize social media. We guest post on Facebook. The city also has a Twitter account with over 41,000 followers. So we send out important messages about rabies so that people understand the risk. We announce new cases. You can see here we are sending out a tweet, and uh, fortunately our followers are really good at sharing and liking, so the message does get out to our population, which is very important. So even with all of the messaging and education and awareness we're trying to get out, we still manage to run into the odd person that has not heard that Hamilton is dealing with raccoon rabies in the area. So we are looking to launch a new rabies campaign, and we're looking at creative ways to draw interest. We don't want people to just glance at our brochure and walk by. We want them to open it. We want them to go to our website and get the information. So you can see here we've come up with um, a new campaign that is very interesting. The baccoon isn't real, but rabies is. Or the scox isn't real, but rabies is. We did several focus groups both with children, adults, immigrants, and we found that in general, everyone was interested, wanted to know what this was about, wanted to know more as opposed to just walking by. So some of the new messages that we maybe haven't shared before or didn't share as much before are messages that are key now. Over 20 years ago when we saw several cases of terrestrial rabies in the area, people knew to stay away from sick animals. If an animal was behaving strange, everybody knew to stay away. But without rabies in the news, people now when they see a sick animal or an animal behaving strangely, they want to help it, they want to feed it, they want to bring it home. So we are trying to drive that message home to people, do not feed, help, touch or relocate animals. We're reminding residents, do not leave food and water bowls outside for your pets. They're going to attract other wild animals. We are also reminding people to supervise your pets. If you're letting your pets out at night, turn the light on. Keep an eye on them while they're out there. 
in light of the recent positive cat we had, we're also reminding residents to stay away from seemingly friendly cats and dogs that you're not familiar with. So uh, I can tell you that since we started to see all these cases of raccoon rabies, there's always something new just around the corner for us to deal with. In June of this year, the Canadian Food Inspection Agency announced that the raccoon rabies strain in Hamilton likely originated from southeastern parts of New York State. So it was a stowaway. We don't know how it got here, but uh, it didn't just cross over that uh, leaky Niagara border. It was not the case. So now what we need to do in Hamilton is contain the animals we have and remind people to not bring in other animals. So we needed to get a message out about not relocating animal, a good um, uh, resource about translocation. So we reached out to Ministry of Transportation to see what their thoughts were on how we could reach out to some of these transportation industries. They told us that the largest national truck show was about to occur the following week in Toronto and that at least 15,000 truck drivers would be in attendance. If we had a resource, they'd be happy to share it. So we made one. We made a resource that caught people's eye and explained the importance of not transporting animals and what to do if you unknowingly do transport animals. This resource was taken to the largest national truck show and it was distributed by MTO. We've also posted this resource at different Ministry of Transportation way scales as well as some local truck stops. It's also been shared with our local port authority. We've also had this resource translated into French and it is now posted at border services in the Niagara area. So we have a lot of local media in Hamilton and we're very grateful for them because they're helping us get the message out. Uh, you'll see here some very honest reporting, raccoon rabies outbreak taking toll on city staff. This is from our Hamilton Spectator. Uh, you might wonder how is it taking a toll in addition to all the raccoon rabies. I can tell you we have seen an increase in our routine rabies investigations. They are up at least 10%. We have seen an increase of at least 20% in our rabies vaccine deliveries. So far this year, our testing for animals is also up by 10%. So on the surface, it might not look too bad, but when you think of all the additional work that's going on behind the scenes with regard to raccoon rabies and the surveillance cases coming in and the education, it, it is a lot. So we also have CBC Hamilton that provides us coverage as well as CHCH News. Um, we, uh, I mentioned earlier that we have done some, uh, some training to high-risk occupations. So this spring we were offering one of those sessions and uh, I'm sure some of you know when you typically when you put on a rabies info session you don't tend to get as many people as you like. Well the silver lining of raccoon rabies is we're finally drawing a good audience and they're listening. Um, at this training session we actually had two journalists come and crash our course. Uh, made us a little bit nervous, but it's good that they're there because the more information they have, the better the messages that they're sharing. So recall I spoke earlier about meeting with local vets to establish low-cost rabies options. We haven't given up. Hamilton Public Health was one of the first health units to pilot the One Health Committee. We meet with our One Health group um, every two months. Uh, we have local RVTs, a freelance writer, local vets. This year we established our very first One Health newsletter through Public Health. This is a newsletter that we share with our local vet community. There's a portion intended for just vets as well as a pet parents portion. Uh, of course our first, uh, our first newsletter focused on rabies. Uh, this was very well received by our vet community. We had several vets that asked if they could post it on their Facebook page or their websites, as well as many vets that asked if they could have printed copies to share. We were delighted to hear that another vet group within, this, within Hamilton had reached out and wanted to host a no-cost rabies clinic at one of our food banks. 
So I'd like to show you this little video. Uh, we're quite happy that they did this, and you can see how happy the people were involved in it. As well. Today we're here with Todd Forward in our local veterinary clinic to be running a free rabies clinic in the city of Hamilton. We have a number of patients today. We're excited to be here and just help out and give back and make sure that we're um, helping people that can't necessarily help themselves right now. I think it's a great initiative. I am really excited to be able to just give back to the community and um, provide people and their pets with something that is desperately needed. So, yeah, excited to be here. I just thought that today was a really great day. It just goes to show, you know, how much pets mean to people. Like, if you want to talk about the human-animal bond, come down to one of the pod forward clinics and you just see. So, you know, we treated uh, people and gave them what they needed and it just felt so good to, to help and give back. It was awesome. We had a lot of dogs and cats uh, coming in today and I think it's a really great contribution to community public health here in Hamilton. Uh, it's an opportunity for people to take care of their dogs and feel good about themselves and their dogs and their cats. So it's really, really fantastic what you guys are doing. Just uh, amazing. It was great to be a part of uh, such a wonderful event. Uh, lots of people came out. It was great to help uh, both pet owners as well as um, helping their pets. And um, yeah, just a, an amazing day. Thanks for having me. Today was an amazing day. Um, it's something I have never experienced before in the sense that we had people from the ABC hospitals together. We had our amazing industry sponsors with us today working hand in hand. And we got to commit and uh, connect with some amazing people in this community. Uh, some of them were beyond grateful uh, in their words that they used today and it was such a good feeling for us to get out of our offices, get in front of pet owners and really make a difference. And uh, that's really what it's all about is people and their pets and we are beyond grateful for the opportunity and I think a lot of people are going home happy today. So we are really happy about that. I'm also very proud to say that uh, Hamilton Public Health Services, along with our Hamilton Animal Control, partnered and hosted our very first ever low-cost rabies clinic last Saturday. Happy to say that even with the torrential rains, we still managed to vaccinate 363 pets. People stood in line in the rain with their pets, their pets got vaccinated, and everyone walked home happy. So we're quite happy with that. So next steps for us, uh, this is not going to be over for a while. We need to fan out our new rabies campaign. We're aiming at targeting schools, libraries, municipal service centers, as well as social medias. We want to revisit our schools, again, target grade two and three students, update schools, parents, teachers with the current situation. We're looking at developing a rabies um, education video that will be helpful. Uh, we also need to provide probably annual uh, training again to our high-risk groups. We are uh, never going to give up on continuing to um, have some low-cost rabies vaccination options, be it a voucher system or some low-cost clinics. And uh, we also need to work on some internal policies and procedures. Uh, so those are finished before any of us go on stress leave. Um, so just before we take, uh, we take questions, I'd like to uh, lighten the mood. I have a little video I'd like you guys to see here. It's an actor's rendition of some possible signs of rabies. Enjoy. I've got such a headache. Oh, that's another symptom. <laughs> of what? Rabies? Oh, that's fatal. You don't want that. I, no, I don't want it. I don't need it. So thank you. Thanks, Connie. That was fantastic. A great presentation. Um, really enjoyed it. Um, really highlighted the collaboration that goes on um, between public health units and inspectors. I, I noticed you talked about MNR, OMAFRA, CFIA, school boards, Ministry of Transport, uh, media outlets, local vets. Like it, it was a great presentation. Um, we'll take this opportunity to um, take some questions from our audience. We'll start here in the room if there's any questions in the room. Okay, okay I'll go. So thank you very much uh, for your presentation. 
Um, I was really, really impressed with both kind of the responsiveness, but also the breadth of, of your response to this issue. And I'm just wondering, um, thinking about the value of all of the things that you've done and all of the resources you've developed, really, they kind of come together to form almost a toolkit or a resource kit. Let's say a similar issue happens next year, two years, five years from now, in another region of Ontario. If a health unit came to you and wanted to adapt a lot of what you had done as kind of an ideal starting place, how easy would it be for you to share like the activity book, the forms, all of those things? So I, I'm not sure if people uh, on the line can hear the question. It was an excellent question just about um, how easy it is for the health unit to share um, all of the resources that they've developed in uh, toolkit format um, should something come up in the, in the future, either in this field or, or, or related as well. Uh, I think that's a great question. Um, this can happen anywhere. Uh, we are doing our best to contain the cases. I know my colleague followed up on a case where um, some raccoons had made home in a boat. So, um, you know, people go up to the cottage all the time. It, it wouldn't be unheard of for someone to head up to Killarney and then Sudbury dealing with this. Northwestern Ontario sees thousands of tourists come up from the states. It's quite possible that can happen. Um, we are more than willing to share. Uh, we've already been sharing our rabies activity book. There's a number of health units. Um, that have, have used it. We have also shared it with the OABT. Um, we're quite proud of it. It was locally produced. Um, so yeah, we'd definitely be willing to share. And our hope too is that once we have our policies and procedures in place, things will be easier to share with the larger group. Thank you. Any other questions in the room before we go online? Uh, just give me a moment here to scroll through. Um, this presentation, as I mentioned at the beginning, will be available on the Sci-Fi Ontario website. Um, it has been recorded as well and will be presented on the Sci-Fi YouTube channel, which you can also access through the Sci-Fi Ontario homepage. Um, give us a day or two and we'll make sure that that gets posted. Um, when we're finished that, uh, our colleague Lori will tweet out that it's available for people to view. <coughs> And then from Christine, um, Toronto Public Health, um, is there any indication that the number of new animal rabies cases in Hamilton is declining? Um, and have you done an epi curve? Uh, we have not. Um, Ministry of Natural Resources really takes the lead on the baiting and the response to the baiting. Um, I would assume over time you are going to see um, increases and decreases, but over the long term, of course, we, we will likely see decreases, and we've seen that historically. So again, specifically to what we're seeing in Hamilton, I, I can't speak to that now, um, but I know that, uh, as you see with other cases where Ministry of Natural Resources started baiting, over time you do see a decline. But again, they've, they've assured us that this isn't going to be a quick fix. Um, Hamilton is likely going to be dealing with this problem for, for the next few years to come. Um, question uh, from Peel. Um, can you expand on why you chose grades two and three as your target, target audience for rabies education? Uh, yes, it's just the, um, the grade level that the rabies activity books are targeted to. Uh, we don't want to give them to obviously grade seven, eight. It's going to be you know a little bit beneath them. So it's just the way that the um, activity book is targeted. It suits those grades best. Questions in the room before we go back online? And Vreen is asking, um, but can you speak more about the estimates of the number of feral cats? How did you get to this number? Okay, so um, the number for feral cats actually um, we received from our colleagues at Animal Services, and there are some equations to it to calculate both the number of stray and feral cats. I don't actually have that information on me now, but if, uh, if someone wanted to shoot me an email, I could share some of the information on how exactly they, um, they calculate that. It's a big number. I'm sure there's lots of interest in that. Lots of, lots of interest online. Um, and I, 
and follow up question that from from Durham related is uh, now that you've identified, you know, that you have this estimate of a large number of feral cats. What are they going to do to address the population? So we have looked into um, some strategies for feral cats, um, and we're all health inspectors, so feral cats isn't really our strong point. So we did do a lot of research on it. I can tell you that there's a big difference between feral cats and stray cats. Um, stray cats are the cats that are most likely going to have interaction with the human population. These are cats that were socialized, perhaps owned before, they're used to humans, they will approach a human and be seemingly friendly. Apparently feral cats are the complete opposite. They are cats that you never see, they are extremely timid and will avoid being seen by humans um, and would not approach a human. Even the caregivers that provide them food, they are not likely to have contact with them. So we have explored different options. Um, and again, initially when we started exploring options for our feral cat um, community, we didn't have an exact handle on numbers. So we're still doing a little research trying to see um, which options are best suited. Um, but in the meantime, we are focusing on educating our population so that Hamilton residents know that they should avoid contact with all unfamiliar animals. Uh, Stephen has a question um, the, about the baiting program. Um, was an excellent idea about a decade ago. We can't be complacent about the issues of rabies. Um, and then, uh, again, feral cat question, which has been answered. Um, are the local vets working together to try and get these feral cats vaccinated? So uh, locally, we do have some um, trap, uh, trap neuter release programs. I don't have the exact stats on that, but I know similar things occur in Toronto as well. Um, I don't have the numbers on, on the percentages for that, though. And Janine's asking, are low-income cost options for vaccination available all over Ontario, um, or was this created specifically for the Hamilton area? So we targeted our local vets, and uh, for the most part, this is um, locally driven. But I will say that uh, we have uh, a real rock star health inspector, Jane Morell, on our team, and she's reached out to some um, some vet clinics that are actually a chain across Ontario, and uh, they have talked about a voucher program across the province. So, uh, so we're trying to help everyone else. The questions are coming in furiously now. Um, from Christine, uh, have you changed your follow-up on vaccination of dogs, cats, more enforcement, and proactively seeking animals, uh, owners who have not vaccinated their animal through services, through animal services? Uh, so that, that is something that we, we are looking at and we are pushing, um, but fortunately, um, again, the silver lining to raccoon rabies in Hamilton is we finally have some low-cost options. We have other vet clinics that are um, willing to lo do low-cost uh, vaccination. We have the no-cost clinic and our low-cost clinic. So we are, we are trying to do it by education and pushing people to these low-cost options as opposed to enforcement because we don't want to take it to people that are struggling already. Um, question from Dean. Um, he was surprised at the number of human-animal contact events only increased 20% given all the media. I was curious about that number myself. Um, would you be able to say that the percent of these is uh, actually required uh, PP? Um, so I think it has to do with the risk. Uh, prior to Hamilton seeing an increase in rabies, um, raccoon rabies in our area, We'd have a lot of exposures that were, were um, cats or dogs that either escaped or happened at a, say, for example, a leash-free park, so they weren't able to get the vaccination history. So now, um, now that we have rabies well established, physicians, um, in cooperation with public health, do that risk assessment, and it's a little bit different. If if you don't have if you don't have the animal and you can't do the gold standard 10-day confinement and you don't have the animal to test, you can't rule out rabies. With the over 150 cases of rabies locally in our backyards and our parks, can we really rule out that a, a domestic pet 
is one vaccinated and two hasn't had um, contact with another rabbit animal. So no, so that, that puts our risk higher. It's likely why we're seeing more vaccinations. And Kenya from York, a couple of comments and questions here. Um, have there been any adverse effects to animals that consume multiple baits? Um, um, would they, uh, is there a maximum acceptable level or would they excrete the extra amount? And then her follow-up question to that is, um, for the low-cost clinics, um, do the participants have to verify their, um, their low income or do you just take anyone that shows up? Okay, so I'll speak to the first one about the multiple baits. Uh, I'm a public health inspector, so I'm not sure um, what too many baits would do to an animal. Um, I would think that would be a question for a, um, a local vet or something that you could possibly reach out to the Ministry of Natural Resources as they are dropping baits. I would assume as they're dropping baits and, and there's no restraints to how many a wild animal could have that the uh, side effects would be minimal, but again, it's not my area of expertise. Um, as far as our low-cost rabies clinic and asking for proof of income, no, we did not ask for proof of income. Um, that is something that we may be looking at for our voucher program, but for the low-cost rabies clinic, uh, we just wanted to get as many pets vaccinated as we could. One, uh, I'll take this moment to maybe talk about one of the own, my own questions that I have is that um, I've always found that it's very interesting when you do the, the bait drops and whatnot, that they use the planes, they use the helicopters, they do hand baiting. Um, we've been doing the same thing for some time. And I'm wondering if there's been any discussion about um, using a, newer technologies to distribute baits. And I, I think in, in terms of things like drone technology or something like that, um, whether or not there's, you know, of anything on the horizon. So again, all the baiting would be under Ministry of Natural Resources. I know that they're very strict with their licensing. Um, we had a lot of people initially when we started doing the rabies baiting in Hamilton, residents that called in and said, hey, I'll take some baits and throw them in my backyard, and they can't do that. So I, again, I can't speak to the new technologies that they're looking at, but I can say that they uh, abide strictly by their, uh, their rules for their permitting for rabies vaccines. And that seems to be the end of the questions online. Uh, Jim. Uh, hi. Uh, this is a feral cat uh, question keep popping up. And it is true, because after my retirement, I helped look after a colony of feral cats in my neighborhood, because they seem to like wild, they're crazy. Uh, it, it's a lot of organization out there actually called a catch and release, a catch neuter uh, vaccine and release program. And uh, so I can help catching, you know, feral cats, take them in, get them spayed, and then they give them a rabies shot chip and then release. Now that's only for the one shot deal for rabies vaccine. And I think the question coming uh, came up on, on, on the screen there from Ni Niagara there. Is that a new technology? I think that would be a good question to MNR regarding a good technology about uh, vaccine baiting for the feral cat uh, 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 population, like in Ontario. In Toronto, I think the staff they gave me was that just in my neighborhood in Topical, we have 100,000 feral cats. But you don't see them, they come out at night. Uh, if you start feeding them, you know where they are, and that's how I catch them. But it's uh, very risky, it's very time consuming, now a lot of time after retirement. But it is true, uh, if they target the feral cat population for the vaccination program, that would be a big plus. Yeah, has, I can't summarize all of what Jim said as eloquently as he did. Um, and I don't know if people on the line can hear the question, the, the, the speakers in the room, maybe somebody could comment on that. But uh, it just seems to be a lot of question about the feral cat population and, and whether or not we can develop a, a baiting for that. So uh, that's a great question, Jim, and it's why we called the Ministry of Natural Resources right away um, and tried to ask them uh, if they could bait our feral cat population. So again, the on-ramp baiting system that they use is not legally approved for feral cats. It's only for wildlife animals, so that wasn't an option. Uh, we tried to talk them into forgetting a few uh, cases of vaccine for us, but again, uh, it is a huge problem. Um, in order to get herd immunity, we need to vaccinate about 80% of the feral cow population. And as you know, that's very daunting. 
Um, and it would take um, a large amount of volunteers and people to get that done. The problem with the feral cat community is you have no control over new cats being brought into the community or litters of kittens being born. Um, so it, it is very challenging. Um, it would be wonderful if there was another option for vaccinating these feral cats. Um, but like you say, the, the good thing about the feral cats, and, and when I speak feral cats, I don't mean those socialized stray cats. The good thing about the feral cat population is they tend to avoid humans. And, and what we are most concerned about is that spillover. We do not want to see a human case of rabies. Um, Stephen's kind of asking a question about what you think was the cause. I know that you, you spoke about you, this rac, the raccoon hitched a ride on a truck or something like that across the border. Um, but if you could comment on, on behalf of MNR, I guess, was there a lapse in aerial baiting um, over the years? Um, because the, or did the baits uh, originally not provide 100% protection? So I, I don't want to speak to the issues for uh, Ministry of Natural Resources, um, but over the last few years, they tend to bait around positive areas. So their baits, I believe in, in, the, uh, in one of the video clips we used, it said the baits last about three years. Um, the concern in Hamilton and any health unit that's not, not part of an MNRF surveillance program is you can't get an animal tested without human or another domestic animal involved. So for example, if you see a cat that's exhibiting signs of rabies and it hasn't bitten or scratched anyone and it has not had contact with another domestic animal, you can't test that. We can't test it under the Ministry of Health as there's no human exposure and OMAFRA can't test that because there's no domestic. So there is no surveillance per se going on without a control or surveillance area under Ministry of Natural Resources. Mm -hmm. I think that might be something worth looking at because we run it, we get the call of these suspect animals and if we can't test it, we could be missing something. So I, I wouldn't say that it has, uh, that this problem was a result of, of baiting. I think the Ministry of Natural Resources is doing an excellent job with their baiting. Um, this was definitely a translocated animal. It wasn't from um, uh, northern uh, New York State. It was definitely southeastern, so definitely hitched a ride somehow. We don't know how. Um, but I think maybe we need to improve surveillance without exposures to, to identify rabies in areas earlier. Okay. Last chance for questions in the room. I'll go do one more question online, and then we'll wrap up. Um, and this question comes from anonymous guest number 10. Um, can the oral vaccine baiting program be used in remote communities for domestic dogs or cats? Um, or I would add on to that personally, can I fly somebody in to vaccinate dogs and cats? Can they send an event? So I, I can't speak to this again. Um, like I said, the Ministry of Nats natural resources and forestry, their uh, vaccine on RAB is approved only for wildlife species. They can't use it on any domestic. It's just not licensed that way. And if they did that, I've been told they run the risk of losing their license. I know that uh, our, our great colleague, Catherine Faleski at the ministry has been working with some northern communities around vaccinating um, animals up there. I would say that she is the best expert to ask that question to. And with that, I'm going to cut off the questions online. We'll just wrap up here. Um, uh, thanks, Connie. Really appreciate your presentation. It was uh, excellent. Just the, the format, graphics, everything was fantastic. Um, appreciate you coming down here in person to Public Health Ontario. Um, and to all of our colleagues in the room and uh, on the line, um, we hope to see you at the October Sci-Fi Ontario Educational Conference and Annual General Meeting. Um, our next PHI Grand Rounds will be on October 11th, um, where Paresh Gandhi will present on Secretary of Fish Poisoning. Um, we urge you to check out the shiny new digs here at PHO. It's a great conference room. If you have the opportunity to come down here and take a look at it and attend uh, the next session in person, that would be great. And with that, we'll say thank you and everyone have a great day.